Last time we discussed methylphenidate, we talked about unfavorable changes that can occur with long-term use. And what I really wanted to emphasize there is that you don't necessarily have to do direct damage to something for there to be unfavorable long-term changes. And what we talked about was, well, people take methylphenidate because they want to increase dopamine levels and that has shown to have positive effects in people. But chronic use of methylphenidate leads to increased dopamine transporters. Methylphenidate blocks dopamine transporters and that's how it gets its increased dopamine. So long-term use increases the number of transporters, right? So what happens is over time, it becomes less and less effective. And then after it becomes ineffective, what is the person left with? Well, they're left with more dopamine transporters, which means they have less active dopamine levels, which is not good. So after discussing this, people have continued to ask more questions, say, well, is there more to it than that? Is it just increased dopamine transporter levels, or is there some kind of direct damage or something else that might cause damage or toxic effects? And what recent studies have shown is that answer to be yes. What this and other studies have shown is that methylphenidate increases glutamate levels. And what glutamate is, is a neurotransmitter, just like serotonin, just like dopamine. But glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter of the brain. So most neurotransmissions are done by glutamate. And it relates to methylphenidate because methylphenidate increases glutamate levels. And with that comes increased focus, a working memory, long-term memory, and a whole bunch of other things. Now, while at first that sounds like a good thing, and it is, but it has its problems. And the problem with it is that high levels of glutamate are toxic, excitotoxic, in fact. In fact, my whole video on excitotoxicity is based off of glutamate-mediated excitotoxicity. So if you haven't seen that video, you can go ahead and watch it. I'll put a link there. Now, the problem with that is that it causes brain death, brain cell death, and brain damage if it doesn't kill it outright. And it can be quite a vicious cycle as it implicated in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases and problems with different types of strokes. So here, think about it this way. So if you've seen my excitotoxicity video, you understand the principle. But also what it did not go further on to explain, and which what I would have done later, is that it is implicated in many neurodegenerative diseases because the cells often that release the glutamate are not the same as the ones that receive the glutamate. So if you have some excitotoxic effects where cells are being damaged or are dying because of high glutamate levels or other excitotoxic effects, it starts reducing your cell count, right? However, those cells that are releasing the, the glutamate or whatever the excitotoxic neurotransmitter is, those ones are not dying. Their job is to release. The other ones that are, are dying off are the ones that are receiving the signal. So as these start dying off, there are fewer and fewer ones that are receiving the signal, and, but there is no reduction in the amount of whatever the excitotoxic compound is, in this case, glutamate. So if, think about it like this. If you're being shot at by, let's say, like 100 soldiers, and you've got 100 soldiers as well, every time one of your soldiers dies, it increases the chance that you're gonna get shot because now there are fewer of you getting shot at. So instead of, let's say, there are 50 of you and there are 100 before, well, it's twice as likely you're gonna get shot because now there are 100 people shooting at 50, right? So how does methylphenidate trigger these effects? Here's how it works. There are three cells involved. There's the cell that releases the glutamate, right? The cell that receives the glutamate. And then there's a third cell in between, and this is the one we're gonna spend most of the time talking about. There's a third cell in between called a glia cell. And what these cells do, well, they do a lot of different things, but one of the functions is that it functions as a housekeeper. So it, it filters out stuff out of the cerebrospinal fluid. It puts other nutrients and neurotransmitters back in. It has a lot of different functions, but we're mainly gonna be talking about its housekeeping functions. And one of those neurotransmitters that it filters out is glutamate. And there are two different sites we're going to talk about on the glia cell. So forget about the releasing and the receiving cells. We're just going to talk about the glia cells, the housekeeping cells. So the main problem with methylphenidate is that it interferes with the housekeeping cell's ability to do its job. It's not able to filter out the glutamate as well. So it accomplishes it by this. So 
The way that it takes out glutamate is that there are certain transporters that pull glutamate in and what they are are sodium dependent. So I guess the best way to explain this is to talk about both at the same time. So there are two transporters involved. One is the one that takes in the glutamate and that's called GLT-1. There's also another one as well, but they're both sodium dependent. So they work by sodium coming into the cell and then it's able to filter out the glutamate at the same time. Then there is another mechanism that takes sodium out of the cell so it can keep that sodium flow going. So I think the best way to think of this, well, a best, better example would be of a dam. So a dam, water is flowing down, right? It flows into the dam and it generates electricity because there is a, because there's a difference in the height of the water, right? So you have some water up here and then it keeps the water flowing this way because of gravity, right? So a similar thing happens with uh, the sodium. So the, if you want to think about it, since there's less sodium inside of the cell and there's higher amounts outside the cell, it wants to keep flowing in until it's even, right? So think of like the dam. Water's gonna keep flowing through the dam until the water level rises until it's even, right? So this is basically how the cell works. Sodium keeps coming in and it starts filling up with sodium. But there is no gravity here. Once sodium is, once the sodium level is equal, no more glutamate is gonna be coming into the cell, right? So what the cell has is something else called sodium potassium ATPase. And basically what that does, if you think of the dam example again, so once the water level is neutral like this, there's, not, there's nothing else that can happen unless you lower the water level, right? So basically what you can do is you can basically take a bucket and just scoop water over the other side and that will lower the water level on this side and then water will start flowing again. Imagine the, the water flowing through is pulling glutamate with it and taking it out of the system, right? So what sodium potassium ATPase does is that it pumps out sodium and then pulls in potassium. So it throws sodium over the side to lower the water level and so that the water can keep coming in and keep bringing glutamate. So here's where methylphenidate interferes with this. What these studies have shown is that methylphenidate in some way or another damages the potassium sodium ATPase or sodium potassium ATPase, whatever order you want to talk about it in. And if you damage this pump, once the water level rises on the dam and you break the pump that throws water over your side, it comes to a stop, right? And then what happens? it stops filtering out the glutamate and the glutamate on the outside of the cell rises because these cells are not able to keep the, the water level down to allow the filtering of glutamate. How damaging is something like that? No one's really sure. There don't appear to be studies on them right now, but without question long term, that will certainly have an impact on someone's performance. If you compare it say to someone who's like an Olympic runner, as someone who just is a long distance runner, let's say I take that same runner and I throw like a 15, 20 pound weight belt on them. And maybe even in the beginning, they may be running at the same speed and be fine. But the longer that race goes on, the more and more that weight belt is gonna have an effect on their performances. Once they start getting tired, it will definitely make itself more felt. And if you think of that, damaging cascade where you have all of those soldiers shooting at fewer and fewer people, then at that point it will become much more pronounced. If someone all of a sudden has a neurodegenerative problem or some other form of brain damage, these things can happen, then it will make itself felt a lot more quickly and a lot more potently in people who have those kinds of issues. But there are a lot of different things that can happen. It just, uh, it just depends on the situation. So. I hope you found this helpful, and if you have any other questions, let me know, and I'll see you next time.